So I'm Robert Groberg, and I have been doing classical networking since 1984. I started working in sort of pre-internet days um, and uh, have been doing that pretty much my whole life uh, in many aspects of, uh, you know, what's called the internet today. Um, I worked at Cisco on and off uh, over the years, uh, starting in 1993, I imagine. Uh, and Bell Labs, and uh, I'd say those are maybe the marquee companies uh, uh, that might be recognized. There's a few others over the years. And uh, my, I think, main contributions uh, or the main interests lie in the transport system. You know, how, how we're moving things from one point to another. Uh, and I got involved in uh, quantum networking specifically a couple of years ago. Uh, was invited about two and a half years ago, was invited to the second repeater workshop. Uh, as we go through the slides, you'll see um, those of you that aren't familiar uh, explain a bit what a repeater is. But um, you know, those are key to making a quantum network uh, functional once we get there. So I would say at this point, we really, uh, if somebody says quantum networking at this point, it's probably point to point. Uh, and it's relatively short distance. If you look at some of the long distances, uh, excluding satellites, they're, um, when they say qu quantum networking, there's some caveats. So what I want to do this evening is go over sort of the uh, development of the internet as, as we know it now. Uh, it's really, I would say, you know, I mean, depending on how you define it, at, at most really 40 years old, right? And, and for the masses, certainly um, really probably less than 30. Uh, you know, early 90s when you know, uh, mail servers and things like AOL and such, uh, Yahoo came in, into uh, existence. And you know, over this time, right, it's pretty much now it's, uh, you know, a utility, we view it as a utility, right? Like electricity or water or something like that. It's taken, taken over the telephone system. Now, when you talk about quantum networking, um, one, of the, one of the key aspects of quantum networking that people in this space envision, right, is coexistence with the internet, right? Uh, there's applications for quantum networking right now aren't really well, I mean, they're not ones that I would say be universally uh, applicable to most people, right? So, so again, I'll go through that a little bit. So I, I think maybe the most value here is to go through, you know, what the internet is, right, and transport, because that will be the underlying um, transport for the quantum internet. And if you come out of this understanding what that is and understanding the basic of quantum transport right now, um, you know, I will have been successful. And uh, the other thing I'm really hoping to get out of this is for quantum networking to really take off, right? It's, it's really needs to provide a service to the existing internet, unless it comes up with a new Facebook or something like that, or, you know, or perhaps distributed quantum computing. But, you know, given the pace of quantum computing now and where it's going, it, it's hard to really uh, envision, you know, such a service displacing, you know, existing services such as, you know, web-based access that's being provided now to uh, things like IBM and Rigetti and, and Microsoft. So uh, let's get started. So, if, hey, Robert, yeah. let me interrupt you here. We're okay. seeing, we are seeing the presenter version of the slides. Oh, okay. So let me get out of there. I don't know how to do that here. Um, shoot, let's see, end slide, so. Uh, maybe, yeah, okay, now we're good. Now we're seeing the full. Oh, you're seeing full screen right now? E well, we're not no. seeing prese presentation, but we're seeing. Oh, let's see, um, set up slides, you uh, Presented by. Oh, you know what, it's the wrong screen. It's good, because you've got the tool screens. Yeah, that's the problem here. Let me see if I can fix this here. New share. Um, let's see, does that, what's that look like? Uh, right now we're kind of like, it's kind of like your edit view. Whoa. Oh, so now we'll go back. To Scared me for a minute. I thought it was a blue screen. Okay. Whew. Shoot. 
Nodes. Okay, how's that work? Uh, we're looking at code or an LS. Sorry about this, guys. Sorry. Right. You're among friends. You know, it's true. Oh, you know. Unfortunately, I don't know how to get um, uh, slide two, desktop two. Okay, let's try that. Right now we're seeing your desktop with a smaller window. I see the Dune desktop. You see the, yeah, okay. So your background, rather. Yeah, let's try it. Bingo. Okay. okay. Good. Okay. Thank you. Good. Thank you. I've got a couple questions for you already, but I'll, I'll wait until you pause <laughs> later on. Okay, good. So, yeah, we can take questions before too long. It'll be a nice break coming along. So I'm going to go through early networking, what it means. Um, Signal encoding, because that really is, uh, we're reaching limits right now. Uh, um, the optical transport and uh, modulation schemes, because uh, those are really uh, impacting our limit. And, and they have uh, you know, great pertinence to what I'm going to talk about later on. Okay. Um, some work that I did while at Cisco, I'm not at Cisco anymore, um, was at Cisco up until the fall, uh, started a quantum networking project there with a group at uh, uh, TU Delft. It's a consortium, an EU consortium called QTEC, which includes uh, universities, multiple universities, uh, and some industrial partners. And, and they have a quantum networking vision. Um, QKD, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, electrical interconnects, um, wave particle duality, plasmonics, and, they, and that's where I think quantum may have a more immediate impact um, than, uh, you know, the quantum computing, which I think is a little bit further out. So let's talk about networking. Here's some early networking pictures. This was uh, from the 18th century, and it used, uh, basically, it was line of sight signals. This network grew up to 5,000 miles long, if you can imagine. And, uh, um, uh, synchronization was an issue, right? Because you had to have the receiver ready when you were transmitting. So from the 17th century, we move into the 18th century, and that's Samuel Morse and Charles Wheatstone right there, and an early transatlantic cable. And as we moved into the electrical domain back then, a bunch of problems were encountered that really weren't understood. It was very, uh, up until the, um, I'd say the 20th century, it was just not understood what happened when pulses of uh, current or voltage differentials were applied um, at, as the speed increased, right? Um, and power increased and distance increased. And so what were we doing in early network? Pretty much the same way saying that we're doing today, right? It's we're transferring information or state, right? And there's early ways of doing this is blowing the sight signals, but Morse code and, and Baudot, those that uh, have been around a little bit may remember 2400 baud and then 9600 baud modems. And what baud refers is to symbols. And symbols and, and um, represent bits or comprised of bits. And when in the optical domain, and it is the same with the wireless domain, the optical domain has effectively become wireless. It used to be digital, but again, trying to increase information flow, it's, I'd say, going back to this wireless space. You want to increase the symbol rate, and then you want to increase the bits per symbol. So how did this come about? So as I said earlier, um, in our... Uh, early days of transmission, it wasn't really understood what we were transmitting or how, or how it was being transmitted. And this, we're living under really theorems and work that was done by these three people, which is Mike with Shannon and Hartley. So the theorems and understanding that came to reach of how information was transferred and how much could be transferred in a given channel and how the information was recovered uh, we're still living in this domain of, of the pioneering work they did and also approaching limits uh, defined by them for the current channels that we have. So optical transport forms the backbone of the internet right now and optical transport is done over fiber. And again, looking at the time frame here, right? 
So only 40 years, right, that we've moved from the electrical domain for uh, information transport into the optical domain. And if you look at the data rates, right, way back in 80, only 45 megabits aggregate, right? Now this was channelized at that time, really the only use of this was for voice circuits, a voice circuit 64 kilobits. And before the signal had to be regenerated, could go around 20 kilometers. Right? It moved up to around 40 kilometers only by uh, 1990. And now in this day and age, we're up to around 4,000. I'll explain why, right? And it, this is without regenerating, which is a key concept we'll come back to later on when we talk about quantum networking. So how do we get these signals onto fiber and what does it mean? So what we're doing is we're gonna take, rather than turning light on and off, which was done initially, right? Uh, we're gonna take a constant, constant uh, wavelength carrier. So it's going to be constant light, and then we're going to modulate a signal onto it. So biggest issue on fiber is attenuation. And pretty much the biggest issue in any transport medium is going to be attenuation or dispersion. And in this, this slide really here describes the domain in which we're transmitting information and the attenuation loss. And, and what you see is the three low peaks or three low um, uh, attenuation segments in the fiber here. And those three have been divided up into those four segments of uh, upon which we send our information. And they're further multiplexed within. Now, initially early on, lasers were fairly wide band, meaning basically they covered a lot of that spectrum and there was a lot of noise between them. So the modulation across wavelengths was fairly limited. And right now that has changed quite a bit with very narrow band uh, uh, lasers so that we can basically divide these wavelengths ranges up into multiple very uh, narrow uh, segments and multiplex across them. So here's what the ITU is calling the, how they've defined these various bands for what's called dense wave division multiplexing. And the reason it's called dense is, as I mentioned earlier, because we have very narrow bandwidth lasers and we can do dense, we can pack a lot of channels into these various bands. And if you look here, and you notice off to the right here, this is a little further on how the uh, multiplexing is done and the channel spacing, actually doing one nanometer, roughly even a little less, uh, bandwidth um, or width-wide uh, modulation on these given channels. And this is from the International Telephony Union and uh, so that this is standardized across pretty, uh, the world. So what do we do? We modulate bits, okay? And early on, it's very simple. It's sort of interesting. We're sort of cycling back to early on encodings and that basically we're pulsing zeros and ones. And what happens is you're going faster and pumping more and more power, basically, this you get dispersion. There's a bit maybe like a better word. Dispersion means different things in different environments, and it, uh, there's different types of dispersion in fiber. But basically, you're, you lose the ability to recover signal. And it's much like speaking real fast. It might be a way of, of uh, uh, modeling this, right? And so the, the idea here really, and again, this is, Shannon, post-Shannon, right, is how do we get maximum number of uh, bits into a given signal? And these are various modulation schemes. We'll go into some of, just gloss over some of the more complicated ones uh, as we proceed and, and why they're important and what, what they mean, right, in terms of uh, limits that we're reaching and where quantum may be of assistance. So Part of the issue, right, in transmitting signal is synchronization, right? So back in, you know, line of sight signals, you had to arrange for somebody to be on the receiving end as you were transmitting, much like Morse code. Uh, when you're sending bits like this, there are multiple, really three main ways in terms of which the signal is recovered, right? So that you can extract the data that you want. And, and one is what's called self-synchronized. You have a phase, phase lock loop that basically latches onto a clock. And with that clock 
can then decode the bits from rising and falling edges within the given periods. And then you have synchronized, which really up until the mid 90s, most of our optical uh, transport system was. And by synchronized, you had a clock that was distributed to all nodes in the network and they all operated off the same clock. And now in this modern era of transmitting what I call um, uh, very complicated modulation schemes, you have coherent detection and I'll gloss over that in a little bit. Okay, so I mentioned amplitude. Okay, just showed you amplitude. Another way of, of uh, modulating data is by phase, right? And, and radios can do this and do do this. And right now, optical transports do this also. We can do multiple amplitude levels. And PAM4, which is pulse amplitude modulation, four level is what is used in quite a number of applications today in the 100 gigabit range. And so basically for each symbol, we're getting four bits out of this. This is just a little more in terms of various modulations. I'm sharing these slides so you can, those that are interested can see this sort of progression and what's happened. But right now the optical transport, you can look at the grid spacing as I showed you earlier and how we're modulating signals onto it. And what we're really trying to do, given the amount of data, right? I mean, this data right here, we're probably generating tens of meg megabits, maybe perhaps up to hundred with all these different users. But given across the populations of the world, right? We're many terabits. If you look at something like Netflix or YouTube, one might guess that they're you know, in the tens of terabits that they're distributing. And so the result is, if you go back to some of those earlier modulation schemes, you can't get that data through. So we come up with different schemes in, in which we modulate the data. And they have different costs associated with them in terms of complexity and power in particular. Uh, complexity, you know, you can engineer around to some degree, right? And, and that is done. Power is maybe a limiting factor right now in terms of cost of heat, right? Because this all translates into heat and how what that means, right? So all these modulation schemes, right? So they're trade-offs, right? Coherent detection, basically recovering phase, that drives your local op oscillator from which you can recover the symbols from which you can recover the bits and direct oscillation too, okay? So you have the phase lock loop at the end. The coherent detection has much higher capacity as you can see here on the screen. And much higher, uh, much more complication. And uh, you know, it's, you can go much further. So these are various coherent schemes that have been discussed and direct. And you can look and see the spectral efficiency, the noise it will tolerate before forward error correction will come in. Uh, CD tolerance is coherent. Uh, I mean, um, coherent dispersion, or I think I've got that wrong, but it's dispersion effectively of your signal as you travel. And then the co complexity of building these circuits. And I'll show you a little picture uh, further on of, of how these were done. Uh, I've been pretty much done the same way right now, but I don't have any current pictures to show. Again, um, I'll show you a couple of schemes here. It's basically showing the electronic complexity. Now electronic complexity here is effectively a digital signal processor. You're doing fast Fourier transforms on the signal to recover the bits out of these modulated schemes. And photonic complexity, what are you doing in terms of the actual photonic signal mixing up? Uh, the laser that's required and the photo detector that's required. Again, it's, it's separate from the complexity is the noise, okay, which with the various modulation schemes will de define what, how many bits per, per second per, per symbol per hertz you can get out of this. So now I'm going to dive in a little bit into what an actual they're called transceivers. What a transceiver is, this is basic, this is the next step from the fiber going to your device. Your device may be, you may have a computer, 
uh, connected, depending on where you are in data centers, computers will be connected up to optical fibers as opposed to electric. Uh, it may be if you're a Verizon customer and have files, it may be connecting into a, um, a uh, Verizon modem. But in, these are for the more complicated higher speed systems. And what you see is a very narrow bandwidth laser and it's split with polarization beams there. And what we're really doing is modulating both the phase and the amplitude. And those MZIs are Mach Zender modulators, or Mach Zender interferometers, excuse me. And those are the modulators upon which you modulate, modulate your data. On the other side, you see a little more of the, um, uh, the electrical side with the um, analog digital converter and the DSP. And you have a DSP on the other side too, but that's uh, not shown. This, again, to give you an idea of the evolution and the huge disruption that's occurred over the years, right? If, if we had stayed in the telephone system, that curve would not have gone up that I showed you earlier for the optical transport. Data drove it up, right? Initially, it was email, moved to spreadsheets, then we moved to video. That's driven the demand to a large degree from you know, 155 megabit transport circuits to 40 gigabit transport port circuits to 400 gigabits. This picture of uh, an early 10 gigabit, up until about 2.4 mid 90s, the evolution was, I would say, fairly, uh, it were doubling, maybe tripling the bandwidth every 12 months or so. But going from 2.4 to 10 gigabits was a huge step. This had to do with the electrical issue, right? Could you turn a laser on and off? at that speed, you can't, right? So you have to take a, take a signal and modulate onto it, as I showed you earlier. To give you an idea of basically the integration and the cost reduction, that large transceiver, it's called the OC192, at the time it was produced, if you could get it, very hard to make, cost over $250,000. In the far right corner, the, these SFPs that you can plug into a computer up to 40 gigabits now are in the hundreds of dollars range. So just keep that in mind, I'd say, as people discuss quantum, right, and, and say that it won't work, right, or, you know, it's going to be too expensive. One, you know, many people in the 80s and 90s thought the same thing about the Internet. So again, just a little more about the modulation that I showed you earlier, right? It's, it's done separate from the laser as opposed to um, turn the light on and off. And it's done external. Again, an early picture, but various technologies are used to do it. And pretty much they're still lithium niobate, I'd say, for um, the, mod the modulation schemes that are used today. At this point, I would say, modulation has become somewhat of a black art, right? There are very few companies that can operate up in the 400 gigabits, right? Because you're really dealing with much like ham radios and radios are to some degree a black art, uh, meaning that there's a lot of intuition. It's, it's not just writing everything down on paper and building it, right? There's a bit of intuition, a lot of stuff that's not understood about how these systems work. So they require a lot of tuning and a lot of optimization and manufacturing process to be able to build these at scale. So what does an IP network look like, right? An optical network. So as I mentioned earlier, it's dense wave division multiplexing. The different colors, because they are different colors, right? The 1500 nanometer range is what's in infrared. So visible is maybe 700 nanometers, roughly in that area. And the way it was divided up, okay, initially, okay, was we were fiber, we were distance limited back, as I showed you, maybe 40 kilometers before we had to regenerate the signal. Now I say regenerate, this wasn't amplified, right? So you would have to go initially from electrical, multiplex the electrical into the optical domain, then every 40 kilometers or so, recover the uh, electrical si signal from the optical domain, and then reconvert it back into the optical domain. So it's called OEL from optical to electrical to optical. This, I think, is 
sort of interesting to keep in mind as people talk about quantum networking, which I'll touch on why this might be of interest later. So in a network, this is just a picture of how things have migrated. So initially it was Sonnet SDH, everything was synchronized, fixed payloads. This picture is really not current. I'd say it's quite old, uh, probably from the 90s or early 2000s of how it was envisioned to move to basically an optical transport network with a control plane on the right, okay? Separating the photonic layer from the switching layer, from the routing layer, and the services, services up above being YouTube, uh, you know, voice, whatever, right? They may be. Here is a very simplified picture of the internet today right? and, and what it looks like. You have spans that can span, you know, in the US, right, they're going to be hundreds of miles at the most, right, before you're going to go into a switching point typically. But rather than every 40 kilometers, which on those spans, by the way, those are, are running over the existing writing or the original right of ways, which would be highways, railroads, in other cases, and there'd be other rights of ways, but most of them are going to be along railroads, typically, or highways, that can be done without regenerating. Right? And so they are amplified, which I'll show you a tiny bit coming up. And if we did not have to re regenerate, or put it this way, once we came to the point we didn't have to regenerate, we could decommission those OEO links or OEO systems, which, as one can imagine, were quite expensive, right? If, if a given transponder or transceiver was a you know, quarter of a million bucks and you're having to regenerate your signal every 40 kilometers or so, you're looking at millions of dollars to do that just in equipment costs, right? And separate from facility costs. So what happened is some very... Uh, um, incredible innovations came out in the 80s from Bell Labs uh, for how to amplify a signal without regenerating. And it takes some uh, advantage, some unique advantage of uh, erbium, which is a rare earth uh, mineral, where you can pump, it's called pump, basically you input power at a different frequency than the frequency just happens because of the, I'll uh, show you in the next slide, the um, properties of that atom you pump at a given frequency and you can amplify at a different frequency. So going back to our grid space in the 1550 range, you can pump it, in this case 980 or 1480, and amplify your signal at 1550. And you're not amplifying an individual channel, but you're amplifying a whole spectrum. And it just here is a picture of how the erbium atom happens to be of use in this particular case. A huge, huge shift in what we were able to do with optical transport, right? going from regenerating every 40 kilometers to transmitting you know, thousands of miles before your signal uh, uh, decayed. Uh, so this is a picture I'll just skip over really in terms of uh, right now, pretty much all fiber is SF, SNF, single mode fiber, 28 microns. So uh, this is the launch power and noise and how, basically how this defines the distance upon which you can travel your signal before you have to regenerate. So here's a picture of a transceiver. Maybe I should stop take questions, uh, Tara? You said you had some very early on. Yeah, I think I'll hold off on them. They're uh, quantum, quantum quantum specific. Relevant. Okay, good. So, yeah, well, we've got a little bit more before we're moving to quantum, not too much. Okay. Um, so, here's a picture of a transceiver in a little more detail, right? So, it's trans transceiver optical subassembly and receiver optical subassembly. Uh, that shows what I want to point out here, right, is the Rx and Tx on the left-hand side, as you're looking, and the power consumption, right? So the laser is a very small portion of the power consumption of the transceiver, right? So most of it's in the analog to digital conversion. So 
was a friend from a friend of mine at uh, Drexel, uh, talk about some of his work a little further on. Um, he's an electrical engineer and working in the field of plasmonics. And the electrical stuff I mentioned last slide, right, we're really moving electrons. Right? It's, it's not sending light, electrons. Electrons are heavy and there's a lot of kinetic energy associated with moving them. And he calls this the curse of kinetic energy, right? So one can imagine this one wants to move more and more water, right? One's expending more and more energy to push that water through, whether it's through gravity or through pumps. So those electrical interconnects are quite important and they're a limiting factor. Surdies are basically how the data is multiplexed and demultiplexed in the electrical domain. And if you look right now, one of those wires have really balanced pairs. If you can only get 100 gigabits across those, which you can't quite yet, okay? With the current manufacturing capabilities we have and the expected end of what we can manufacture um, in silicon, we're going to max out. And the power associated with these is a delimited factor separate from uh, the actual manufacturing of these. And again, I would say, I think IBM is probably a main manufacturer of Certes. There are not many of them. If there's any others, I'm not, really not sure. Uh, it, it really has, because of the very complex modulation schemes, the same ones I mentioned on fiber, or similar ones used on Surtees, is just, it's moved into a very, very difficult engineering problem of how these are built, because we're reaching limits defined by Shannon in terms of how much we can modulate onto a constant carrier. So one of the ways this is uh, uh, obviated and, and dealt with is, and this is relatively new if, if those that uh, are following this is some announcements just recently came out of Intel about their silicon photonics. Just keeping in the photonic domain as long as you can or removing the electrical domain. In the case of um, uh, electrical inter interconnects within multi-chip systems, right? Computers, compu uh, networking systems. If you can avoid these surges, which don't go very far, right? in terms of at the most a couple meters, right? That, that may seem like a lot for a circuit, you know, board or computer, but if you look at these big switches, big data centers, it can be quite far, okay? We're quite limiting the distance. Before, again, you can regenerate, effectively, electrical regeneration is very expensive. So just a couple pictures of how this is done. One thing very nice about silicon, silicon manufacturing is that you can build optical vias into the silicon. There are some quantum startups that are based, based um, basing their quantum compute on the optical, in the optical domain using uh, optical modalities to represent quantum state. Um, Psi quantum is one, there's up, one I believe up in uh, uh, Toronto, I, the name is slipping. But, those of you in the quantum compute domain know that there are multiple ways to represent a qubit. This is a nice picture that really summarizes the issue with optical and electrical. And the reason I'm going through all of this in particular is I want to tie this into the quantum compute and quantum networking that is done in the optical domain. So quantum networking, let's talk some about that. Maybe that's what you're most interested in. Quantum networking, the only way this is gonna work, right, for over any, any distances is in the optical domain. Now, quantum computing covers multiple domains, right, of using qubits, right, from quantum dots of superconducting, those are typically operating in the gigahertz range to MV diamonds as one, ions are another, trapped ions, iridium might be one of them, right, that's used. And for those uh, in particular, MV diamonds and their, the trapped ions, their optical frequency at which they operate is much lower than the, uh, or wavelength, excuse me, for higher frequency there. Uh, the wavelengths are gonna be in the 700, 600, and, and I believe a little bit lower for some of the trapped ions domain for 
that which their photons are storing uh, quantum information. I'd say the main hype right now around quantum networking is around QKD, uh, several variants of it, measurement device independent QKD, constant variable or continuous variable QKD. Uh, but there's some other significant um, uses for quantum networking. Distributed quantum computing. Okay? One of the ways, one of the issues with quantum computing in particular right now is the size. Superconducting com quantum computing, uh, quantum dots, et cetera, really you're looking at magnetic flux and magnets even in the small scale are quite large. We will not be able to scale up into the billions of qubits much as we have as we've done with um, quantum uh, or with uh, transistors. And that's because the actual switches, for lack of a better word, the, the um, circuits, they're much, much larger because you're dealing with flux. Okay. Some of the other things that uh, are proposed for or will be useful for quantum networking are telemetry, you know, basically hooking up telescopes and by doing this in a quantum world, you can get really wide arc apertures. Timing is another one. And sensors. Now, sensors have been around a long time, right, with MRIs. Uh, that's a quantum effect uh, sensor. But there are a number of new ones now that have really taken off uh, that probably aren't too well um, recognized. Uh, GPS, there's some quantum GPS that's coming out right now. GPS right now works off radios coming from uh, satellites very susceptible to jamming. Quantum GPS is not, right? It's a quantum effect. Uh, magnetometers is another one. Uh, you can use magnetic field of the Earth, which has been mapped out uh, up to, I believe, tens of thousands of feet over the year, uh, along with uh, quantum GPS to really get very precise um, locations. So let's look about quantum networking. As I said, I mentioned earlier, while at Cisco, I worked with uh, this consortium, QTech. And their goal is to build a distributed quantum compute system in the Netherlands. Now, if one is to build a distributed one, a geographically distributed one, I should say, uh, the Netherlands is probably a good place to be because it's a fairly small country. Now, some of my friends argue, well, well why would we do it geographically? as opposed to given the scaling problems we have right now, I do expect, you know, really the, the, the first real use of this would be uh, distributed quantum computing where one might have, depending on the number of qubits you could assemble in a quantum computer, you'll have an optical interconnect, right? So whether it's trapped ions, if we can build transducers to convert uh, uh, gigahertz up into terahertz uh, spectrum, uh, there's a bunch of research being done in that now, then one might have imagined uh, con connecting, uh, superconducting quantum computers this way <clears throat> to get a large quantum computer. And as mentioned, this Quantum Internet Alliance, okay, it's an EU consortium, is looking to build a quantum network from across these four cities. I believe the largest span might be between Delft and Amsterdam. It's only 60 kilometers, very short. So as we look at how far we can transmit a photon before we have to I mean, use the word regenerate, uh, which isn't quite right, but uh, I think it's, it's a good analog, right? Before we can regenerate, we're sort of at pushing the limit uh, by which we might be able to transmit qubits. Uh, there are a lot of other programs coming up. The U.S. is racing right now to uh, catch up. I would say the QTAC consortium, the EU is maybe furthest ahead except for China, which is a bit opaque to us. Uh, but there's a quantum program uh, with DOE, um, University of Chicago, Northwestern, a couple other schools, I'd say maybe you know, second in, in, uh, in terms of what they're doing. It's, it's really just started off the past year or so. Uh, the Shanghai to Beijing link has been you know, advertised as a quantum network. Now, I wouldn't really quite call it that, right? Because it's a point-to-point -point link number one. It does have a long distance, right? But they run into this problem of uh, quantum decay over, again, they're limited, I believe, to every 40 kilometers. And they have what it's called a quantum repeater. 
Now, there are two types of repeaters in the quantum world. One is trusted and one is untrusted. I think they're sort of mis misnamed in that way. Right? A trusted repeater really is recovering quantum state and regenerating it. So at that point, you've gone back into the digital domain from the quantum domain. The beauty of the quantum domain is you can't copy it. If you intercept it, you can't, uh, you've, you've broken the link, right? So that causes its own issues, right? But it, it's really of no use to the circuit at that point. So a trusted repeater is optical equipment, electrical equipment in a hardened hut with a guard around it, basically. So that's, that's the Chinese link that's been advertised. It's also done optically uh, with the satellite, and they've been able to generate, uh, I think, a Kia from somewhere in China to somewhere in Austria, right? So you can send these uh, photons, of course, um, through space. Lots of issues right, with that, right? Clouds being one, water, atmospheric disturbances. And there are other programs. That the first one was really done at MIT Lincoln Lab, uh, and Northwestern back in the early 2000s. Okay, what does a quantum network look like? At least this is what I took out of uh, my work uh, with QTAC. And so we have current network problems, okay? Security, everyone hears about security. The internet was developed as an open system. And to a large degree that made the internet successful, right? Everybody could come. And then commerce came. Commerce came, the thieves came, they had to bolt on security. Okay, similarly uh, with um, uh, information sharing as it became ubiquitous and private. But there are, you know, these problems that we continue to, it's really this strange dichotomy, right? You want an open system so everyone can use it, but you want a secure system so you're, you're protected. And so there's this tension between the two of them both cost and need, right? And, and security, of course, is the big issue of today, right? Because it's really is a utility, right? You can't have our utility broken, right? Whether it's for banks, commerce, uh, or secure private communication. So quantum solutions, one thing they do offer, right? Is private, trans private, trans private transactions, excuse me, right? Blind comp Blind quantum compute, for those of you that uh, may have heard of that, right? This idea where you might be able to send a computation off to a quantum computer, and the quantum computer does that computation without really understanding, without knowing what is being done. Now, there have been some attempts, right, at, at bolting this on, right, to our existing computational systems. Intel came up with this uh, concept called SGX, which is Secure Enclave, with the idea where you have a secure an enclave within your computational systems on chip, right? Where you can run a computation and those outside of that in other areas of memory can't see what that computation is. But again, it's bolted on. If those that follow it will have watched and seen over the progression of deployment, bugs associated with it, fixes associated with it. One thing that's interesting or has interested me a lot, right, is if you look at this quantum, these quantum systems, is a lot of new technologies being developed to send and receive photons, right? And, and can we sort of go back instead of, you know, doing these very complicated modulation schemes that are reaching channel limits, is there a way to maybe use photons and go back into what they call the TDM domain, time division multiplex? So here's a picture. This is one picture that came out of uh, my work at Delft, right, in terms of how, um, and again, this is uh, while I was at Cisco and uh, really came out, I would say, was led by the QTech consortium, Professor Stephanie Vayner is the leader of this quantum internet alliance there. And it was one picture that uh, was developed that shows what I call the platform dependent view for the quantum compute. Delft and QTech are quite interesting as they have mo multiple modalities they're pursuing. pursuing. They're, uh, both Intel and Microsoft have labs there, co-located. Uh, Microsoft's pursuing Fermions, so very long, coherent, uh, stable qubits. Uh, Intel is pursuing quantum dots that basically it can be manufactured in, with CMOS technology, short coherence. Uh, and the uh, 
lead PI professor, uh, Ronald Hansen, is working with MV Diamonds. MV Diamonds, are, a lot of work is also being done at Harvard, uh, University of Pennsylvania, and other places uh, using MV Diamonds okay, as a way to store quantum state or build quantum computers. One of the issues with MV Diamonds, as opposed to fabricating uh, superconducting uh, qubits or quantum dots, is envy diamonds, it's a nitrogen vacancy in the carbon uh, lattice. And those that are created by blasting nitrogen at diamonds. And so really it's a stochastic process. It's, it's very, it's, there's not a well engineered manufacturing process to build these. So as you build these envy diamond uh, quantum computers, right? It's, you know, you take some diamond and you blast some nitrogen at it and then you examine the diamond to see where your, your qubits are and what the interconnectivity is. So we see a couple of things here, the quantum computer, the QKD device, and then these physical devices need controllers, okay? And so with these controllers, timing is one, there's a bunch of associ associated control in terms of how you operate these devices. But here's, uh, what one tries to do in these networks is abstract the control systems from the physical systems, right? So ideally, one might like to be able to replace an NV diamond with a trapped ion, for example, probably closest and most likely where you might be able to do that. But again, it's very early on. It's very poorly understood what we're going to do with a quantum network. Because we're not quite sure how we build ones. So the state transfer, what we're doing, as opposed to a bit that we're trying to transfer, we're transferring a qubit. And that's done with a Bell state measurement. And you encode a quantum state onto a photon, and whether it may be already on that photon from an MV diamond or built onto that photon, and you transmit that photon, and you do a Bell state measurement across both. And what you get basically is a wave function collapse, and you get a probabilistic result in terms of what you may have transmitted and received. And the probability of receiving, it's really a picture I'll show for the next slide here. Um, what you're really doing is measuring an amplitude here. And so the a very nice convenient way to look at it is via a block sphere. And it's a three-dimensional sphere with an amplitude in an x, y, z uh, space. And you're taking a measurement of that amplitude, that wave function, on a given basis, whether it's at x, y, z, in this case, at zero, one, you look at it. And the amplitude will define whether it was most likely a zero, most likely a one, and what the probability of that being such. So Bell state measurements are generated and done in different ways, right? The previous picture the very sh showed a uh, photon being transmitted from one to the other. But another way of doing this is taking photons from two separate sources and sending them to an intermediary source. And this is the way MDIQKD works. And in that intermediary source, you're gonna do a Bell state measurement on the two photons received. And you'll have a correlated state between the two endpoints from which you can recover bits to generate a key. Another way of generating a bell pair is using parametric bound conversion. I believe that's what the PDC stands for, where you basically, with a given uh, is a, a type of crystal, you can stimulate that crystal to develop two photons that are going out that are correlated and send those two photons two different ways. And uh, from those two endpoints, do measurements to recover the information. Now, the, both of those ways of doing that, I think, are pretty interesting and have their benefits, right? Generating a bell pair in the middle, okay, does take care of a timing issue a little bit. It, it sort of moves it from one place to the other. It moves it from the center to the edges. Uh, but it doubles your distance. Because now your, your bell pair, your photon, only has to travel half the distance. So what are some of the problems here? 
as I mentioned earlier, right, NV diamonds emit at the wrong wavelengths, right? Wavelength conversion is pretty well understood and has been done, right? So we can move it up into a domain where we're, we're not limited by the, uh, um, the fiber characteristics and attenuation. Bring it up in the telecom domain. Uh, hybrid networks, I'll, sh I'll show in a little bit, uh, the Delft is trying to do, the QTAC consortium is trying to do. One has to multiplex, right? Uh, and how one multiplexes these signals, whether you're converting into which particular band has a, a big impact on how far you can travel. Because even those are very narrow band lasers, so I was mentioning, there's an effect called Raman scattering where basically you get photons that are sort of bouncing out of their, their very narrow band uh, wavelength into other ones. And if those, if the Raman scattering affects the transmission band wavelength over which your qubit's going, you lose your qubit. I just saw an article just this week for silicon car carbide. This came out of, I believe, Wuhan. Uh, one of the things that's just so cool about the space is changing so quickly. Silicon car carbide, there's manufacturing technology in existence that build chips in, the, in, the, in this particular uh, material, unlike NV diamonds, right? So you can actually control the process. And the other thing that was very cool about this article is it can be done, uh, the, the domain of which the light uh, photons are emitted is in the telecom bandwidth. So exponential decay, as I mentioned, we're limited. Now here comes the regeneration problem, right? And uh, there's no amplification, right? You can't amplify a qubit. So what you're effectively doing if you're amplifying is you're you know, destroying the state. Right? So when you measure a state of a qubit, you're losing that state, the state collapses. And it's, the other issue is uh, coherence time. Okay, how long can you maintain this state? Right? Because if you're sending a photon and you're going to then try and correlate the state to the other end that receives it, the way that's done is digitally. Okay? And that is operating roughly seven times, seven tenths the speed of light, right? By which you're sending, uh, modulating this, that's how fast light travels down the fiber at this wavelength. So if the device that's being used to generate this state does not maintain the coherence, does not maintain that state long, you've lost the state, you cannot transfer state across. Uh, for NV diamonds, that's not such a big issue. They probably have, uh, they do have a very long coherence time on order seconds at this point. Um, just an interesting uh, little note I'll put up here. Rob Shulkoff uh, is one of the pioneers in saying superconducting qubits. He's out of Yale and uh, also has a uh, quantum uh, startup. I think it's called um, Quantum Circuits, uh, building a, uh, a quantum computer. And one of the things that, uh, because of his pioneering work, right, uh, with both him, there's a few other laws named after these scientists that have done this pioneering work over the past uh, couple decades, is he noticed that the coherence uh, factor, or decoherence he calls it, uh, you get basically a factor of 10 every three years. And I believe uh, superconducting qubits have gone from microseconds to tens of microseconds and maybe off there. I'm not sure if I believe that's the correct uh, order. So how do we transport state over longer distances? I mentioned earlier. This, uh, Robert? Yeah. Can I ask you, I was yeah. trying to ask you a minute ago, but I couldn't get off mute. Yeah. Uh, one question from uh, the galley here is, uh, why does the optical fiber not cause decoherence of the qubit? So decoherence really is the decay, or is it, it's used really is the decay of the qubit because of time, right? So the photon state does not decay as it's traveling. It's an interesting um, phenomena, right? And the phase you can tr the phase does can change, but you can maintain phase. And I really do not understand the physics well enough for that. The decoherence that does occur, right, is on the endpoints, right? or the decay does, wasn't de decoherence, right? It's the decay of the state because of attenuation. Did, did I understand you right? So when, when you're, 
transporting a photon, it does not decay. No. Well, only if we hold it somehow. Well, no, no, it does. It, it, it will decay, right? But it will decay because of other reasons, right? I mean, a photon can maintain a state for a long time. I mean, you have photons, entangled photons that are billions of years old, right? From the formation of the Earth, you know, the for Big Bang time, right? So, no, photon without any external factors doesn't change state. Hmm. Yeah, that's a, photons really are quite stable by themselves. Attenuation is the limiting factor. Okay. So, the way around this, okay, is to regenerate. Now, it's not regenerating in, you know, the, the idea of bits, right? You're, you want to basically preserve quantum state. You can't regenerate quantum state. But what you can do is preserve quantum state via Bell state measurements. And the way you do this is basically have these two photons come together measure the state. Okay, once you do that, that collapses. What's more interesting, okay, or really required for a quantum repeater, right, is memory, quantum memory. And again, this is an area that's advancing very rapidly. And in the next couple of slides, I'll show some recent work that just came out of Harvard uh, in, the, in this space using NB diamonds, right, where you can basically trap a photon and then that Trans basically changes into a transition within the NV diamond. And you can hold that state for some time. Not to believe it's on the order of seconds. Okay. So without quantum repeaters, we're limited really to 40 kilometers, roughly. Now you'll see, you know, experiments where they'll say they've gone hundreds of kilometers or through space thousands of kilometers. Um, however, Practically speaking, those hundreds of kilometers across fiber, there you get very low bit, bit rates because you have to send lots and lots of qubits to actually get a, a useful one out of it. And to engineer something, it really is a physical limitation of a fire, fiber that you cannot get around. So how are these Bell state measurements done with memory, right? Which is really cool. So back with the other two pictures I showed you of Bell state measurements where the photons were generated in the middle where they were already entangled and the ones where they met from the two endpoints, you have timing issues. And so those are, to get two photons to meet, coincidentally, you're really in the femtosecond Fermi regime, which really is very, very hard to do engineering wise. Very, very hard. And you have to consider the fiber, right, upon which you're traveling. Fiber is affected at that time scale with temporal effects, right? So the temperature goes up, the fiber characteristics changes, okay? The speed of that photon traveling in the fiber changes. So how you get them to arrive at the same time is very difficult. Now, here's some work, as I mentioned, just out of Harvard, right, where if you have some memory, you have a lot more flexibility, right, because you can store that state in the memory and the other photon comes in, whichever one happens to come first. You can then do the bell measure, do the entanglement across your stored photon, it's a different, different representation at that point, and the incoming photon. And create the wave function, re, or recapture the wave function between these two points. So, QKD, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on QKD because I think there's so much hype about this and I, th I think it's really not good for the community. Uh, and there are a number of reasons for it, right? So if you look at the way our security works right now, we use both symmetric encryption, what's called symmetric encryption, and asymmetric encryption. Symmetric encryption is quite cheap, but you need a secret key, a shared key to do that, right? And the way you share your key right now is with an asymmetric protocol, the PKI, that basically is using property of large primes and their co-primes where you can share a key right, across that. And so sim simply how this works, right, is you use PKI between two devices, share a secret key. Once that secret key is shared, that connection is broken and you use the block cipher 
to uh, transmit your data. So what QKD does really right now, all it does, right, is generate a secret key. So the idea, okay, and, and the hype around QKD is that secret key cannot be compromised, much like PKI shared keys have. Now, why have PKI keys been compromised? A couple of reasons. One was the initial key size, right? And the initial key size, that the cryptography by Diffie and Hellman out of Stanford, they predicted back then, okay, this was in the 70s when they came up with the scheme, they said it was, the key size was limited by the computational capability of the machines generating this. They said that you know, as compu computers get more uh, stronger, they'll be able to break this key size. And so there was a, a um, a uh, was called an RSA, um, forget exactly what it was called, but basically it was a competition to see how big a key one could break. And the idea basically that that would keep the, the um, industry and the community aware of how big we had to make the key. The bigger the key, the more, comp the more uh, computational power required and the longer it took. But anyway, we're now in the domain where it's quite easy to use a, a 4K key. And so cryptograph that is quite cryptographically hard. The largest key that has been broken and was just recent, I believe, was under like 980 bits or so. And the current algorithms used to break this Divi Hellman exchange, computational complexity goes up not quite exponentially, but it's yeah, you know, order exponential over two thirds, something like that. Uh, Robert, yeah. just uh, to just step back for a second and uh, just make sure we're we're good on QKD. So, QKD is quantum key distribution, mm -hmm. and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's essentially, uh, you know, in the internet uh, when we pass back and forth encrypted data. Uh, the first thing that really needs to occur between two two parties uh, is to exchange a secret key between them so that they can in, uh, encrypt their data using this secret key. And uh, quantum key distribution is not really encrypted encrypting the data. It's about just that first step of exchanging the secret key between two uh, computers. Exactly. So, uh, correct? That's exactly correct, yes. Yeah, and so, you know, I think a lot of people out there generally assume it means, okay, all of your data is going to be uh, encrypted using QKD, when in fact, QKD is just merely, right now anyway, just exchange, you know, that protocol for exchanging the secret key. Exactly. Yeah. And last thing, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, as you said, uh, really it's all about having a in proven, provenly uh, random key uh, that is in fact random, whereas on our computer systems today, it's really not a random key. Yeah, well, pseudo-random. Pseudo-random, right. Yeah, so, so initial problems, okay, with TLS, SSL, this protocol by which things were encrypted, where the keys weren't random at all, right? And, and those were just bugs, right? I mean, I, I think the pseudo-random seed that you can get out of a computer, depending on how you generate the seed, right? If you look at brass cancel has lines for memory, right? Delays for accessing memory. Those are, you know, they may not be completely random, but they're highly, they've got an awful lot of entropy associated with them. So is it to be able to predict those sort of timings and, and some, you know, work was done four or five years using that as a seed to generate the key. So I, I think in, in the real world, the actual lack of entropy in the key is not the issue. I mean, it certainly has been, in terms of hacking, right, and bugs, but those are implementation bugs, right? It's not the lack of ability to generate a random key, right? So that's my feeling, right? And I don't 
experience, you'll find people arguing differently to say, you know, we can't generate a key with enough entropy. Right? So we may have software that doesn't do it, but that's, that's an implementation issue. Mm -hmm. But but given that then, okay, if we're relatively comfortable with the uh, randomness of our keys, the generation of those keys, then really what value does QKD actually bring to the to the table? A very good question. And, and I would say, you know, enough people that understand this are not able to communicate it, right? Yeah. To the community to say, oh, you know, what, what value is this bringing, right? Yeah. Uh, and into anything, I would say it, it really increases the attack surface. It makes it, you know, it, it just gives you a whole lot more vectors by which you can, you know, attack your system. That Shanghai to Beijing wing, right? Every yeah. 40 kilometers, you have an ability, right? Or you have, a, you have a weakness, right? Where if you can get into that hut, right? You can compromise the key, right? And so that's one issue, okay? But it doesn't really buy you any security. But then the other issue is, well, how long does it take, right? A PKI, PKI exchange can be done, you know, in milliseconds, right? By which you get a, a secret key, right? 4K, right? And here, you know, this is old, right? And, but this is a little more recent, right? We're only getting 26 megabits, okay? So, okay, well, you can get keys and you can change keys, but it, it's still very slow. Now, where it could be very interesting, but uh, let me just go through this briefly. So how is this done, right? And this will be done for any quantum networking, right? If, if you're gonna build hybrid systems, right? You're gonna have both your classical data and your quantum data, right? And, and the reason you're going to do this is it's incredibly expensive to build out these fiber plants. And so the likelihood of one taking fiber for quantum only, unless there's a real value add, you know, it, it's not going to happen. And, you know, there may be some customers, some people, some, you know, some consumers that, that will want a quantum key. And if so, it's going to have to be multiplexed on existing systems. And so the way that's done is it's done at a different wavelength than, uh, than your data tr transfers. Um, so the data transfers up in that 1550 re region. The 1510 is used for the optical service channel, and that's really the control plane by which this is all done. And then in this 1300 range, you can generate the, uh, photons and, and send them outside of your data channels. Now, there are issues um, that I believe that, that, that have not been fully worked out, right? As if your data channels are full with lots of power, you get this Raman scatter, which will, which will cause... Um, you know, basically, you know, the breakdown of your photon. Just another picture of how this is done with, uh, with amplifiers. Okay, so if you are doing an amplification, you want to put Charlie at a point where the amplifier is. Is I'd say sort of this is a lab experiment picture, right? To see how much power you can pump down a fiber before your photon in different different uh, domain will be um, corrupted, for lack of a better word. So it's an hour. Let me go through a little bit because some of this is redundant. Just some more pictures of how this is done in labs. And to your point, Terrell, it's like why any QKD, right? It's, you know, the security problems aren't crypto problems. They're implementation problems right now. You know, not using random keys. The protocols are quite complex, not, not really well understood by more than, you know, the community that understands um, SSL and TLS and PKI is not very large. And the, the other thing is the QKD, if I've, going back to those pictures I showed earlier, I mean, you've got new devices, a lot more software. And there's a certain, you know, factor of bugs per lines of code, right? And you've got lots of code with QKD. The other is denial of service, right? So with quantum, right, if you're sending, you want to generate a quantum key, you know, the benefits of it, right, is it can't be intercepted. Well, but that's also, you know, a liability, kind of can't be intercepted. If someone inter intercepts it and wants to deny that key exchange, it's really quite easy. Yeah. So, and the other thing is, is it, are we really going to break, you know, PKI with Shor's algorithm? Well, you know, Peter Shor himself says, you know, others have gone and looked, basically analyzed 
what it will take to run his algorithm, which is fundamentally is a period finding algorithm using uh, a quantum Fourier transform. And it's going to take a million qubits. We use logical here in the case for you know those that uh, most people believe that there are going to be errors and have to be error corrected. At running at a megahertz cycle time with T2 time, the coherence time of over 24 hours. Now, one thing that QKD might be useful for, if you can get the secret key rate up, is the uh, one-time pad. A one-time pad basically is every bit you XOR with your, your secret bit. And that's information theoretic secure. Uh, you, know, it, it, you know, maybe at the gigabit rate, it might be of interest. But, you know, and that gets rid of the whole key exchange issue. So let me just go through this quickly. This is actually the more interesting part to me is can we extend quantum or use quantum to extend classical? What's being generated right now for the quantum space, single photon detectors and single photon sources. Now, I showed earlier limits of electrical interconnects, right? We can't build you know, faster electrical interconnects. So can we go back, right? Can we use photons to transmit this? So here, here we have uh, Planck, Einstein, and de Broglie, right? And they, and they really came up with this equation for this wave-particle duality, right? It's just, okay, well, you, if we're continuous wave, how many photons are in this continuous wave? And they came up with a fairly simple equation to do this. Right? So what we can do, okay, is basically, okay, we're sending continuous light, right? But that continuous light is made up with photons. One can imagine, okay, hasn't been done yet. And if it was done now, given the uh, uh, frequency of these devices, both the detectors and the uh, transmitters, it would be quite slow, but it, I think it'd still be quite interesting to, to you know, pursue, right? It, can we send a photon or a burst of photons? And a given time domain, a given time slice would say, you know, Photons equal light, or photons equal bits. No photons equal no bits. So it's pretty simple, as I showed earlier, how this is done. So let's just look at 1550, I think it was, was C, and PAM4 encoding, and the normal power for a fairly short distance, okay? And we'll see the number of photons versus the bits per second, all right? And this is low power, right? We've got four orders of magnitude more photons than we do bits, right? Can we include photons as a bit? Photon or lack of photon. So what do we do with these photons, right? We're still limited by this electrical interconnect. So can we use another effect, okay, to move the photon, okay, across some distance and actually act on it in some computational uh, way? So Plasmonic waves are a way to look at this, perhaps, right? To transmit information over larger distances at much lower power. So much like I showed earlier, the curse of kinetic energy, Bahram also looks at a plasmonic wave. And a very way, a very good way, a good analogy for looking at the power consumed, right? Rushing river versus, say, a leaf dropped into a pond, and, and you're using this wave effect to transfer energy as opposed to electron. So we can move information from point A to point B without moving electrons. Gets rid of the curse of kinetic energy. And this is a device he's built that actually does this currently. And here's just an idea of what the power is, okay, uh, associated with doing this. Okay, so if you look at a Surtees, Okay, and the amount of power, okay, milliwatts that requires to do PAM4 versus per bit versus milliwatts in a plasmonic wave. Again, huge, huge difference in power consumption. So those are some things I'd like you to think about, right, in terms of, you know, what sort of, you know, quantum, quantum effects have been, are, prevalent in a lot of areas in healthcare, you know, sensors and things like that. A great deal of effort, energy and, and research is being done in the quantum compute domain. And there are those that will be looking at these advancements and say, can we use these things in other areas that have huge impact? And areas where 
you know, we're sort of stuck, right? X-rays and MRIs is a nice example, I think, right? Your GPS is another area, right? And so last, I'll just leave you with a slide on information theory. Okay? The information theory and error correcting codes, uh, Holovo, uh, there's a thing called Holovo's theorem. And this is from a slide that I took a photo of, uh, of course, Isaac Chuang took, uh, gave at uh, MIT. And much like Shannon defined information theory in the digital domain, uh, Holovo has defined it in the quantum domain. So I think with this, I'm going to, uh, uh, I'm, I'm done, right? We've run an hour and five minutes here. And, uh, you know, Carol, if you want to feed some questions, I'm happy to take some. Okay, Robert. I, uh, while you were finishing up there, I just told the group they've been so well behaved that I'm going <laughs> well, <they're> to <laughs> try to, try to unmute everybody. And uh, let's see if it, if it gets chaotic. I'll just mute everybody and we'll do it one at a time. Okay. Uh, so heads up, participants. I'm going to unmute everybody. And uh, at least I think I'm going to turn it so you can unmute yourself. So if you have a question, feel free to ask. Uh-oh. Okay. Maybe people should mute until they have a question. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions, anyone? I know there was a question out there. Uh, can you give us about a paragraph on uh, Shannon's Law, just so we're all up to speed on that? Well, Shannon's Law, basically what he does is look at a given signal and how much information you can, uh, really I'll give you a sentence or I don't have to give you more, is how much information you can put in that signal, right? Before noise will basically corrupt that signal and you can't recover it. So, so it's, it's, it defines it really in terms of entropy, the randomness associated with sending that signal before the randomness, I would say, overtakes or overtakes the signal that you're trying to send. So yeah, uh, you use, uh, use the analogy of perhaps yelling, right? At some point, if, if you, or maybe a loud stereo, right? So, you know, a poor stereo won't go very loud, right? But if even very good stereos at some point here, the noise is going to overtake what you're trying to put out. And it just sounds like a bunch of jarbled. Well, it turns into noise. noise. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it is noise. Yeah, and he really defines it in terms of uh, what you'll see is signal to noise ratio. Right? Okay. That's well, this, here's another one. This one came in quite a while ago. Uh, is there an ARPANET like uh, ARPANET for quantum? Yeah, so that, that's I mentioned earlier in the slide. So you have this quantum internet alliance. Um, well, in, in Chicago, functioning one is another. You have you have efforts to build one, right? And they're calling it. Uh, they're going yes, they're calling it a quantum internet. So there are efforts to build one. And say China has one for sure. Um, Quantum Internet Alliance in, in uh, EU is another one. This uh, University of Chicago, if you look that up, its name is David Ash Ashwalam. I'm probably pronouncing it, butchering that name. But there's an effort there. There's been an effort at, on and off at MIT Lincoln Labs, uh, starting up another one. Um, so there are efforts to build a quantum. They're using the word quantum inter internet or quantum network. That's, that's the word they're using. Can I add a follow on to that? Yeah, George. Thanks. I've worked in telecom most of my career. I remember the advent of optical fibers, and I watched it sort of like come through. Now, what are the goals of these quantum networks? Some of these distances, I don't see them as very credible. We've nope. got like real problems in the regular That's classical <laughs> optical world now that we haven't solved. And I'm just wondering just what are the expectations, what are the results they want out of this network? Are they just trying uh, to that's, a point. that's why I spent so much time I've okay. been in that world a long time too, the telecom world and, and gone through all of that myself, right? So so um, I think they're poorly misunderstood. I mean, they're just, I shouldn't say poor, but so they've got a negative connotation. They're really not well understood, right? So there's this idea, right, that, okay, well, you know, we've got this internet. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of these physicists and scientists really don't understand the, the uh, telephone world, right? Like you and I do, or the, the optical transport world, right? So they think the internet and they say, well, let's build a quantum internet, right? And, yeah, per the uh, 
that roadmap that I showed earlier, right? Their idea is, well, we'll build a big distributed quantum computer, much like we have a big distributed computer today, right? Which is our internet. Uh, but they don't understand, they certainly do understand, right? The distance limitation. But I think what's really can be a bit, um, actually, uh, dangerous, right, is this idea of QKD, right? I think really it needs to be really tempered the expectation of quantum secure communication, right? So, so the expectations I would say are pretty limited, right? I mean, you know, understand we can do 40 kilometers. Well, if we can get a build, if we can build a repeater, and the reason I mentioned the 40 kilometers earlier, right, is I don't know how long you were in the telecom world, right? But back in the days before we had EDFAs and, and Roman amplifiers, right, you'd have these regeneration regenerators every 40 kilometers. Well, those huts are still there, right, on these right away, right? So if there was a real application for a quantum network of some sort, and you could build a quantum repeater, right, with memory, right, that could hold a quantum state for so long, you know, it's if the application was there and the need was there, that could be done, right? Do I foresee it anytime soon? No, but you know, a lot of people didn't foresee, right? most people didn't foresee things like Facebook or YouTube, right? So I wouldn't discount it happening, but all I'm saying is I don't know what it's gonna be. <laughs> well, 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 the reason why I bring this up, right? The people who would make the investments to further this research are gonna be the carriers, right? They're going to be the ones that will be the primary beneficiaries. So if they don't see the, the, the goal, the, the rationale to make this investment, it's going to be like the dot-com where they allowed these clecks, these people to build fiber. They went broke. Then they just bought them all later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I agree with you 100%, right? The carrier certainly isn't going to spend any money on this, right? I mean, they may be will support QKD for some customers that, you know, demand it, right? But doing a disservice to their customers would be my uh, would be my view. <laughs> so. well, well, I guess the other point I want to make, right? Do you remember Corvus? They uh, had some tell me. What I said, do you remember Corvus? Corvus uh, was hey, a net, net, Corvus was a network provider who had created a new technique that would remove repeaters in the carriers' networks. Mm -hmm. They also claimed to give exponential distance. Mm -hmm. But they were just bought out and shut down because the carriers didn't want to spend all that money to go through their network and pull out all these devices. Oh, but that's already been done, right? I mean, Sienna and Lucent actually did that. I mean, Lucent enabled um, Nortel to build their 10 gig in that gigabit, gigabit network, right? I mean, I was at Bell Labs from 98 to 2001 and, and uh, it was an interesting time, right? It was best sure. And, and AT&T... Um, the legacy of Lucent, the service provider, did not believe that there was a need for more than 2.4 gig, right? Because it's like, how many telephone circuits do you need in the given channel? But they didn't understand the internet, right? And, and Nortel did, right? So Nortel bought those lithium niobate modulators from Lucent Microelectronics and got a Lucent's transport business. <laughs> so so um, I, if there is, and that's an example of a need and a value proposition, right? Those OEO huts were really expensive to maintain and, and to equip. And you could replace them with EDFA amplifiers, a simple device, right? I guess, I, I guess the big question, WDM is moving forward, right? We will get more all the time with that. No, but no, that's my point earlier. That's why I spent so much time on modulation, right? And, and going through um, Putting up Shannon. No, we're reaching limits that, that, that people don't think we're going to get past. No, I mean, theoretical limits. Right? The modulation schemes that are being done, the noise associated with them, um, the, the fiber characteristics. Now, um, there's a bunch of research being done into new fiber, but to your point earlier, I mean, who's going to rip up the existing fiber and put in new fiber? Right? I mean, maybe they'll add new fiber, but that new fiber is going to require a whole new system of, of transceivers to go along with it. But we are reaching limits, right? And that's what I sort of, you know, I think is an area that might be of interest if, if we can go back, and, you know, somehow take advantage of this wave particle duality and plasmonics to, to get rid of this electric, move the, basically you want to remove the electronics, 
as many electronics as you can remove you want to, right? Because they're expensive. I guess, you know, if we keep, you know, I see the value in a quantum computer, right? I think we all understand that. Mm -hmm. But um, we're going to probably use the existing network, won't we? I mean, will we need a second or a different network? Well, again, I don't see... I don't see the application. Blind quantum compute would be an argument for it. Um, but, you know, it's going to have a very small population probably that want it. That you might, you know, it depends on what the quantum computer can do, right? I mean, one, I mean, I don't see it, right? But, you know, suppose you get the super duper quantum computer and, uh, you know, web-based access right now is digital, right? And it's really just a front end to a quantum computer. But you can't do blind quantum compute right now, right? Um, well, I can't do a period, right? But uh, if there was a need, right? And, you know, healthcare might be, you know, some types of research might be where, you know, these quantum computers are so expensive. Again, that's a thing hard to you know, trade off the investment in infrastructure, as you point out, versus, you know, these companies that need it, maybe they'll just go buy a quantum computer. Is there any scenario that you have discussed where there might be a reduction in latency? This is the this is the only reason I can see for a new network. In any of these scenarios, any of the people that you've talked to, have you seen any of them talk about how they're going to reduce the network latency? No, you can't change the speed. You can't change the speed of light and fiber. Okay. And it, it, actually, the latent the round trip time is doubled, right? Because you have to do the Bell state measurements. And so you send your photons, if photons meet, they need to do the measurement, and then you send the results. So you've got an extra round trip. Let me, let me add some two cents here, if I may. Uh, uh, listening to what George is asking, I, I, I would add, George, if I may, that, you know, I think we're, when it comes to quantum computing and quantum devices, except for atomic clocks and MRIs, I think we're, we're in the really early days of experimentation and and instead of saying something uh, is definitely going to change the world or not, I mean the hype you know gets in front of the real good discussions, but there you know I don't think there's anybody out there that is entirely convinced that you know a quantum internet uh, will work or even make sense quite frankly. We're just in that stage of you know, let's throw some money and time and energy at it and uh, uh, see if something comes comes out of it. Like, you know, as Robert mentioned, you know, uh, we were talking about the Q, uh, QKD earlier, you know, I mean, really, what kind of value does it add uh, today? But, you know, you don't know. The, the, I, think, I think the feeling is that there's something about quantum that makes it very different profoundly different than the way we do things currently. And uh, there may be some use cases where it has, makes profound differences in our lives and other cases where, you know, what we're doing is just fine, you know? So, uh, you know, we're in, a, we're in a, a testing and trial and error phase. I don't think anybody's claiming that, you know, we'll, we'll replace today's internet. No, uh, I mean, it's quantum. all research, right? I mean, there's, yeah. I'll take, there's one, yeah, it's, it's all research at this point. Yeah. yeah, everything, all except for MRIs and atomic clocks. Well, it's, and, and various, a few other sensors. I guess, yeah. Yeah, 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 so. yeah but I mean, you know, when I talk to the guys who are really deep in into quantum yeah. uh, physics and stuff, I mean, it's the sensors. They they're pretty confident, at least those have a uh, that that will be uh, that they, they have futures for sure. Right. 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 So. And some well. people are probably making money on it now. Well, maybe if, if there is one more question, let's take that. Otherwise. Anybody else? Uh, there was something about, uh, you talked about trusted quantum repeaters. Ah. Can, you, can you talk a little bit about untrusted quantum repeaters? What's the main difference? Uh, the main difference is you are transferring quantum state, right, as opposed to reading quantum state, right? So. Um, and to do that, you need memory, right? Because you need memory to maintain that state at a minimum for the time it takes for the state to, trans, uh, to transmit across the fiber. So you do a Bell state measurement, 
you need to preserve that state for the length of time it takes to do not only the Bell state measurement, but to send, excuse me, you're not doing the measurement, to do the entanglement, okay, and then continue with that uh, information down the, um, down the fiber. Okay, and, and, and the untrusted, again, this, I'd, I'd say this name here, is you're not doing the measurement. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. <laughs> last call. Any last questions, comments? Yeah, I just got one more. Any, any, any new materials have you experimented with that look promising? You, know, you remember when we talked about erbium dope fiber earlier? Yeah. Do we have any materials that have a, a natural alignment with quantum? What do you mean natural alignment? Well, just like, you know, when we put erbium in the, in the glass, it allowed us to extend the range of fiber to crazy distances. Right, right. Have, do we have any materials that just work better with quantum states than other materials? Oh, I don't. I, I, mm. the tough. But work better is not a word I would use, right? Because if you look at the quantum material, conducive for conducting well, quantum. So, so there, there are a bunch of parameters you need to look at, right? With quantum materials, right? And it's a quantum state, right? So by definition, quantum states susceptible to noise, right? MB yeah. diamonds can maintain state in the presence of noise better than superconducting qubits or quantum dots. Um, trapped ions, again, similar, right? They're, they come from the atomic clock work, right? So they can maintain state longer. Um, I, in the slides that sent the point there, put a URL to a paper that just came out of uh, China using silicon carbide. Um, so they're multiple, they're different materials. They all have their trade-offs, right? Um, trapped ions, uh, MV diamonds are real slow uh, relative to superconducting qubits in terms of the operation time. Coherence time is longer, right? So I would not say there is any material that is necessarily you know, a natural or conducive to, you know, quantum. But that's me. <laughs> and then if you go look at these different uh, scientists and researchers and startups, you know, the startups in particular, right? I mean, you've got all these different modalities. You've got the uh, light, you've got trapped ions, you've got envy diamonds. I don't think there's a quantum compute startup with envy diamonds. They're sensors for sure. Um, a superconducting qubits, quantum dots, et cetera, right? Every, each startup that's pursuing that modality believes that's the best modality because <laughs> they got a lot of money going into them. <laughs> sure. Okay, Robert, okay. thank you very much. Good. Well, I hope it was of use to all of you or of interest anyway. And, uh, Thanks so much. Yeah, okay. Indeed. Uh, Learned a lot and a lot more to learn from, uh, from the recording. Okay, good. Have a nice evening, everyone. Thanks a lot, everybody. And Robert, have a good night. Bye. Bye-bye.